On July 30th, 1971, a little past 10 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, a lone figure descended a fragile spacecraft onto the surface of Earth's moon, Luna, in what is known as Hadley Ryle. The figure was Commander Dave Scott, and only the seventh human to descend to the surface of the moon. As grainy television signal was broadcast of his first steps on the dusty soil, he gave a small speech, as was customary for the first steps on the moon at that time. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. This comment on human nature would be far more true than Commander Scott would realize, as 300 years later, humans had pushed the bounds of exploration to extend the entire solar system and were about to take their first steps in the light of another star. Welcome to the complete history of the Star Citizen universe. My name is Paul Shelley, and I will be your guide through the winding roads of history that have led to the modern day of Star Citizen. During the early 21st century, humanity was at a crossroads. Overpopulation, combined with resource shortages, were wrecking havoc on the nation-states of Earth. Pollution from the larger population made arable land harder to come by and led to massive famines that ravaged the planet. Resource wars raged across the world, and everything from energy, food, and even water was getting harder to come by. This is known as the human overpopulation era, it would last around 120 years, bringing life as we know it on Earth to the brink of extinction. Space was seen, at the time, as the solution to their problems. So the boom of private space travel that had started on the first quarter of the 21st century was flung into full swing, with companies racing to try to make space travel and space exploration cheaper and easier. It was during this time of troubles and hopeful aspirations in this precipice of a new dark age and a renaissance of space innovation, that, in 2038, a man would form a company that would change humanity forever. That man was named Chris Roberts, and that company was Roberts Space Industries. At the beginning of this company, its future was far from certain. Mr. Roberts was fascinated by space travel, but lacked the funds and connections to compete with the big dogs of the industry. However, there were many issues that were plaguing the average person on Earth, whose solutions would also aid him in his future space goals. By 2043, Roberts and his team had developed their first product, a hyper-efficient battery converter for civilian vehicles. They followed afterwards with a compact water purifier system and an energy-efficient power network. They even attempted to alleviate hunger by designing efficient cricket farms. While all these products saw minor success, they kept RSI firmly rooted on Earth, and thus Roberts continued to look for innovation that would allow his company to truly live up to their name. In 2061, he found that breakthrough. While studying a crop of doctoral dissertations on space travel from a prestigious engineering university, the work of one Dr. Scott Childress stood out. It is unknown when Dr. Childress was born, possibly records lost to time. However, we do know that he was married and had an older daughter, Rebecca, and a younger son, Danny, and also seemed to be a dedicated family man. What we know for certain is that Dr. Childress is the father of the quantum core engine, commonly known today as the quantum drive. This engine creates a bubble around the ship, which contracts space directly in front, while expanding it directly behind, being essentially an Alcubierre drive that had been theorized in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. The process involves the manipulation of energy density around the ship. Since it's contracting and expanding space around you, your frame of reference stays the same, meaning that anything inside the bubble feels no effect of acceleration. It manages this through the use of what is known as quantum fuel. This is the fuel source used to create the required negative energy density around the ship. The key to this harnessing came from a transient quantum particle, which greatly affects the mass and space around itself. 
This was first discovered in large particle colliders on Earth in the early 21st century, but were difficult to capture because they were very fleeting. The key was to use a specific trans isotopes, likely iridium and other radioactive isotopes, where these transient quantum particles could attach themselves for a slightly longer duration. Scientists could then separate these particles from the isotope and store them for future use. While it isn't directly specified, it is likely that Dr. Childress was the first to come up with a practical way to harness the power of these transient quantum particles into creating the quantum bubble around a spacecraft to allow for greatly increased space travel. However, there were still limitations. Dr. Childress's first proposed drives would not be able to achieve more than 1% of the speed of light. A large amount of power was required to convert this quantum matter into negative energy field. Such a field generates a significant amount of heat. The continued operation of the drive creates more heat than almost all ships have the ability to absorb, but the larger the ship, the greater capacity for both power generation and cooling, so heat doesn't build up as quickly as it would on a smaller ship. Still, this represented a huge advancement in the area of space travel, allowing for larger ships and less fuel to make longer journeys faster. As such, Chris Roberts contracted Dr. Childress and brought him on board the RSI team to develop his engine. While it's not directly stated, it can be implied that somewhere along the way, the US government became involved in the project, likely through NASA. After years of hard work and development, the drive was completed in early 2075. And on May 3rd, 2075, Dr. Scott Childress and likely Chris Roberts joined the President of the United States in unveiling the Quantum Core engine. This invention radically changed humanity, opening up the entire solar system to exploration and exploitation. Soon, RSI would become the leader in space and colonization technology. They steadily improved quantum travel technology and helped to build the next generation of spaceships. While there is no date, it can be assumed that around this time, RSI began construction of its large ship manufacturing center at Earth's L5 point, designed to build massive spaceships capable of traveling the solar system with ease, and to bring back the precious resources that Earth needed to survive. They also began to work on their Magnum Opus, a technology that would rival the quantum core engine in its importance in human history. Planetary scale terraformation. There was one part missing to their plans, one part that had been attempted many times, but never successfully. Artificial intelligence. The first record of AI dates back to Tokyo in 2044, just a few years after the birth of RSI. While the details are sparse, we can infer that in 2044, some form of AI was installed, either in the cars or the traffic systems of the city. In a disaster known as the Lemming Car Incident, the AI malfunctioned and caused 12,456 deaths and countless injuries, making it one of the worst disasters in the 21st century. Despite the setbacks, the scientists and engineers of RSI firmly believed they had a solution to the problem. It's very likely that RSI would use newer AI systems after 2044 in their quest for another major goal in human space colonization. Mr. Roberts greenlit the program shortly after the successful completion of the Quantum Core engine. And finally, RSI would unveil the result on April 13th, 2113. It was called an atmospheric processor. Sadly, Chris Roberts would not live to see it, dying in 2108, but leaving a legacy that would reverberate until the present day with his oft-quoted philosophy. Learn from the past, reach for the future, fuel innovation, cultivate talent, and always be relevant. With the atmosphere processor complete, the eyes of the world governments turned to Mars in a hope that making the red planet habitable would finally solve the ongoing crises of Earth. In 2120, a collective human effort began with the backing of corporations and countries from all over the globe to terraform Mars. This would become known as Project Renatus, which in Latin means born again, to reflect the hopes of both a new Earth and a revitalized red planet. The project began with the landing of the first personnel sent to scout for locations to set up the Atmo processors and to build various HABs and geodesic domes to house the project's staff. 
Soon this location would be known as Port Renatus, named after the project, and would grow to house thousands of humans working to turn the Red Planet into a permanent home. Back on Earth, things were changing drastically. Many nations began to merge due to the need for more resources and collective security. The European Union solidified as a nation, and Canada, the United States, and Mexico would unite in the North American Alliance. While it's unknown exactly when this happened, it's likely after the creation of the first Quantum Core engine. It's during this time that the idea of earned citizenship first begins to rise in the North American Alliance. Likely as a result of the resource wars, the NAA needed soldiers, and to sweeten the pot, they offered NAA citizenship to any who fought in the new United Army, giving them voting rights for the overall government beyond their native nations. This was a controversial decision, some seeing it as elitist, while others seeing it as a means to reward those who wanted to build a stronger nation. Still, this would be the foundation of the citizenship system that dominates the UEE today. These changes would illustrate the growing need for Renatus, and a growing global alliance of various nations who were beginning to realize just how close the species was to the edge of oblivion. The best way to avert it was not alone, but together, and soon the Renatus Project became the symbol of a new, united humanity, a multi-planetary species free from the restraints of our home planet. As a result of this, Within five years, the project was nearing completion. The Atmos processors had not only managed to increase the air pressure, but make the atmosphere breathable. And by 2125, humans were walking on the surface of the Red Planet without any protection, breathing Martian air. It all seemed like humanity was about to accomplish yet another stunning feat in the conquest of space. Then two days away from the process being labeled as a total success, at 0438 Eastern Standard Time, something went terribly wrong. No one knows exactly what happened, but what we do know is that none of the workers were wearing protective equipment, and the incident happened so fast that no one raised the alarm or sealed the ventilation ducts. 4,876 workers, engineers, and scientists on Mars were killed as a rapid collapse or reversal of the Atmo processors caused the Red Planet to once again be hostile to life. While it took time for the nations and corporations of Earth to rediscover what went wrong, eventually it was revealed, after a 10-year-long investigation by various media outlets, that at the heart of the Renatus project was an experimental AI. It was likely the reason for the rapid pace of development and also the likely reason for the sudden failure. This incident further soured the public on the idea of AI being developed further, but was never proven to be the reason for the ultimate fate of Project Renatus. However, it wouldn't stop the need to make Mars a fully habitable planet to alleviate the problems of Earth. So eventually, the nations of Earth returned to Port Renatus, buried their dead, and began again this time without the help of AI. It would take over 30 years to perfect the process as a result. However, the work needed to continue, not only for the future of humanity, but to honor those 4,000 plus people who had already died attempting to breathe life into the red planet. While Project Renatus painfully proceeded, the scientists of RSI were hard at work tackling their next big project. They had made the solar system reachable, built the tools to transform worlds, and now they wanted to make space travel affordable. Thus, in the 2130s, the Zeus program was formed, a project to design the first ever affordable spaceship, capable of taking off from Earth and traveling all over the solar system. By the mid-2130s, RSI was ready to test their first model, and proudly broadcast the first test flight on June 23rd, 2136. The ship blasted off into the sky, only to begin to rip apart. As the ship was leaving atmosphere, it exploded, killing the test pilot and embarrassing RSI. Yet another blow to their pride and the dreams of the future, barely 10 years after the public failure of the first Mars terraformation attempt using their technology. 
In desperation, RSI used its connections to the military, who had utilized the Quantum Core engine to build a small space fleet by the early 22nd century. Specifically, RSI turned to one of the best test pilots of that fleet, Michelle Solano, or Sal, to her friends. She had extensive experience with the Quantum Core engine and held the honor of being the first person to quantum jump past Jupiter. Soleno had been pressuring the military to train new test pilots, as their pool of experienced pilots was small, and she knew that if the Zeus project was successful, they would need to expand the fleet with new top-of-the-line ships to maintain flight superiority with civilian expansion. She saw a partnership with RSI as the key to promoting her new pilot program. The military finally formed the 999th Test Squadron as the new home for all future pilots of experimental craft. The 999 designation was meant to be temporary, but would eventually stick. They also agreed to provide valuable resources to the Zeus program to allow RSI to achieve their goal, with a catch. The pilots of the 999, headed by Michelle Soleno herself, would oversee the entire project. Sal battled RSI executives, demanding massive changes and a complete redesign of the Zeus from the ground up. The process took almost a year to complete, but on March 19, 2137, Michelle Sal Soleno climbed into the cockpit of a brand new RSI Zeus to take it for a test flight. With bated breath, the world watched as the daring pilot took off with the ship, flying it into space before returning it and gently touching back down to Earth at 1509 Eastern Time. This catapulted the pilot into stardom and increased support for both the Zeus program and expanding the military space fleet. Both would prove to be fortuitous in the years afterwards. By 2140, RSI officially began to sell the Zeus to private markets, making space travel affordable beyond the scope of nations and megacorporations. While the Zeus was limited to a short-range quantum travel, it represented a major advancement in the realm of affordable spaceflight. It is also well remembered today, with the owner of Consolidated Outland owning several original working Zeus models. Now the pieces were falling into place. The solar system was not only reachable, but affordable. Humanity just needed somewhere to move and expand to relieve the pressure on Earth. As a result, the Zeus joined hundreds of other vessels, bringing people and supplies back and forth between Earth and Mars, between the 2130s and 2150s. This endeavor was seen by many as doomed because of the failure of the first terraformation attempt. This was highlighted by an article written by a famous reporter from the Sentinel News Org, Kelly Forsett, discouraging people from risking the journey to Mars, entitled, Don't Tempt Fate. Many pilots and colonists printed the article out and crossed out the don't, making the slogan for these early pioneers, tempt fate. By 2157, these tempters of fate had managed to do what so many deemed impossible and complete Project Renatus, making blue skies on Mars. On March 18th, 2157, in the city of Port Renatus, Mars, Senator Stephen Nguyen of the North American Alliance gave a speech, honoring his brother, Sean. Sean had died in the tragedy of 2125, and Stephen was there to unveil a memorial to the fallen and honor the day as Mars officially became the first planet terraformed by humanity. While his speech was mostly somber, remembering his brother fondly, he ended it with an affirmation. He hoped that humanity would take the memorial not as a monument to sorrow, but one of inspiration, for the names etch on its surface to become a battle cry for humanity's exploration of the stars. The speech would be remembered by Martian school children to this very day, for shortly after it, as the politicians, scientists, and engineers celebrated the accomplishment, a single cry of pain was heard over the crowd. A Nigerian woman, one of Port Renatus' engineering supervisors, named Kina Okan, was going into labor. She and her husband had been part of the project for several years, and while her doctors had suggested she return to Earth to give birth, she had refused, as Renatus had become her passion project and wanted to remain on Mars to see it done. Now she was going into labor, but was only seven months pregnant. She was rushed to the base's infirmary, and early in the morning of March 19th, gave birth to her daughter, 
of Benny Okan, the first human ever born on a different world. While she remained in observation for several weeks afterwards, as no one quite knew what consequences were for a child born outside of Earth, eventually she was released to her parents to be brought home, and it was then that little Benny would become the most famous human to ever live. Her every move was documented by media groups, as she was dubbed the extraterrestrial child. As Mars grew, so did she, becoming a symbol for the new future of humanity. She was the hope of every colonist who secured a ride to the Red Planet to start a new life away from Earth. Eventually, the fame got to her, as she reached her teens and early twenties. Attending lunch parties and being seen hanging out with high society of Mars, everyone knew that eventually this would take a dark turn. The media was hoping to see the first human born on another world crash and burn. However, it did not happen as everyone thought. One day, as she was leaving a party, she was confronted by fans and press. However, this time, there was an exchange of words. Words that seemed to strike the youthful Abeni, because after that night, she disappeared from the public light. She never explained why, but she began to work in Port Renatus' community outreach programs and moved into areas that needed more attention, the poorest districts of the city, and as far away as she could from the fame that once defined her. While Abeni would shrink from the limelight, humanity continued pushing further into the system. By the 23rd century, space stations had been built in the asteroid belts and around the moons of the gas and ice giants. Materials were flowing back to Earth and Mars at a never-before-seen rate. The human overpopulation era was officially over, and the beginning of the solar colonization era had begun. By 2200, multiple Earth governments announced the plans for an interplanetary holiday to celebrate 45 years of human habitation on Mars. The official date was to happen during the following Earth-Mars conjunction, March 18, 2202, to emphasize the connection between the two planets. Martian schoolchildren were also invited to submit names for this new holiday. The name Stella Fortuna was selected from an entry by Estelle Pira, age 11, of Port Renatus Public School 17. Large public carnivals were sponsored by companies on that day, being held on Earth and Mars. They had rides, food, games, and discount tickets to attractions throughout the Sol system, from the asteroid belt to the Jovian moons. They even raffled off new parcels of land on Mars and a quantum-capable RSI ship. Martian businesses even got into the spirit, selling souvenirs stamped, We Tempted Fate, Stella Fortuna 2202. At the end of the day, the skies of Earth and Mars were filled with gold and green fireworks. This would turn into an irregular celebration every two years around the Earth-Mars conjunction. During this time, traditions around the holiday began to codify. As Mars continued to grow and prosper against all odds of the early naysayers, the holiday began to be associated with good luck, helped along by those families who had won land during the first celebration. Business ventures would start on it, Explorers would start their trips on it, even couples would get engaged on Stella Fortuna. By 2257, the majority of Earth and Mars governments declared the official date of Stella Fortuna to be March 15th every year, finally cementing the holiday as the first official interplanetary celebration in human history. During the first half of the 23rd century, progress was continuing ever forward. RSI continued its development of newer and better engines, managing to achieve speeds of one-tenth of the speed of light, or 0.1c. With this came the development, likely, of one of the first purpose-built colony vessels, the RSI Chariot. It was built to house thousands of humans, tons of freight, and using the best quantum engines humanity had ever developed. It also had the capability to house an artificial intelligence system, the first ship of its kind to have such a system. RSI and other countries and companies did not let the failure of the Mars project stop AI development, many seeing it as essential for future exploration of the stars. As even with the most efficient quantum drives, it would still take hundreds of years of travel to reach the nearest stars. No human could make that journey in a single lifetime. Thus, it was seen as essential to develop AI systems that could function on par or better than human pilots to navigate these ships to their destinations. All of this would lead to the development of Project Artemis, 
an RSI chariot purpose-built to make the long journey to the light of a new star. The ship was equipped with 5,000 stasis couches to house the crew, which are progenitors to the modern-day stasis capsules used by bounty hunters and other professions. It was commanded by veteran space explorers, Captain Lisa Danvers and engineer Arthur Kenlow, to name a few, and it also housed a brand new adaptive AI system named Janus. By 2232, the crew was readied on Earth with their massive ship, and during the dedication of the mission, an older woman in her 70s emerged from the crowd to speak. She was Martian and instantly recognizable, a Benny O'Conn the extraterrestrial child had emerged from her exile to see the Artemis off on their journey. There she explained that she was famous for just existing, that she didn't deserve or want the attention, and that the true heroes, the people humanity should look to, were the brave souls who boarded the Artemis for an unknown fate hundreds of years in the future. She finished by remarking that she was trying to be better and to do better, but that she wanted to hear from the real space heroes, and yielded the mic to Captain Lisa Danvers. That would be the last public appearance of Abenio Khan, who would pass away on September 12, 2252, at the age of 95. An entirely different fate awaited the crew of the Artemis, who, shortly after their festivities, blasted off from Earth and into deep space. Once the ship left the solar system, it went quiet. Despite attempts to reconnect with the vessel, nothing was ever been heard from the crew of the Artemis. Eventually, many would blame the AI for this failure, just another failure and a long list of failures since 2044. It was this high-profile case that seemed to have buried the public development of AI, a status which has continued to this very day. Ten years after the launch of the Artemis, back on Earth, a young woman rode a maglev train that would help change the course of history. Since the mid-22nd century, a vast and complex web of maglev trains had been built across North and South America called the Trans Am. It stretched from Barrow, Alaska to Punta Arena, Chile. This train became the third largest stretch of continuous monotrack on the planet. By the 23rd century, it was moving tons of freight daily, but was getting old, and improvements in suborbital shuttles were quickly catching up with the old maglevs in terms of cost. What complicated matters more was that the various government bodies responsible for the upkeep of the system all failed to generate enough interest and funding to retrofit the rails. Governments and their people were interested in faster quantum drives, staking their claims on Mars and the outer planets, and generally moving their influence into space. An aging, out-of-date railway was almost of no concern to the people of the Americas. That would all change when one plucky engineer figured out a solution. Her name was Alana Redmond, and she grew up on the line. Her mother was a shift manager aboard the train, so she would move from town to town frequently. Alana thought of this as a vital task, bringing the world together because while information was easily able to be transmitted all over the system, it took people like her mom to make sure that everyone got the goods to where they needed to go. When she graduated from college, she returned to the Trans Am line as an assistant engineer, where she soon understood the magnitude of the issues that the trains were facing. Patchwork on the rail was near constant, as the entire structure was going on a century old with little improvement over that time. Emergency stops were routine and cost the company money and time. It was on one of these stops that she noticed a bit of scrap metal that had been twisted by the magnetic forces from where the train had inadvertently run over it. The curve of the bent metal was about as good of a result as the repair equipment they were using on composite patches. It was then that she realized how to speed up this process. While she couldn't test her theory on an active line, she reached out to a friend with access to some old engines and a test track. She then cashed in all her vacation time and spent two weeks working on the solution. The result was an automated system that would scan the tracks for weaknesses, and as the train would run over that area, place down a patch in front of the engine, allowing the forces of the moving train to patch the hole. While the system wasn't perfect by the time her vacation was up, she knew that the idea was solid. 
So with excitement and trepidation, she quit her job and founded Argo Technologies to develop the system. The name was a play on her first two initials, A and R, an idea her mother had given her. By September 2243, the Argo Automated Monotrack Repair System was developed. The system was portable, able to be installed on every modern engine, and would maintain the tracks with such a degree that they would run like new with little to no stopping time required. This made the older tracks much faster, but also allowed for development of new trains using older tracks, speeding up the time even faster to compete with suborbital hopper shuttles. Soon orders came in from every major train line on the planet, and Argo Technologies became a sensation having saved rail travel almost single-handedly. However, Alana Redmond wasn't done yet. Over the next decades, more innovations were developed. Faster cargo latch and lock methods, new passenger management systems, and a vibratory recharger, just to name a few. Eventually, they would require Totorio Manufacturer, a train engine manufacturer, and would change the name to Argo Transportation, transitioning to building the trains and cars themselves. Their attention to detail and exacting standards made them the industry leader, but even then, they weren't done. By now, Port Renatus was a full-blown metropolis and was in desperate need for a public transit system. While Argo had never built a transit system from scratch, Alana Redmond's impassioned pitch to the governing board won them the contract. Her vision for what she called a radial network transit hub would become the standard for modern transit systems even to this day. Sadly, she would not live to see the completion of the Port Renatus rapid transit system, dying before the project's completion. By the 2260s, humanity had started to colonize the outer planets, with regular traffic now flowing towards Neptune. The moons of the outer planets were seeing regular commercial and private traffic as humanity pushed to make the entire solar system their home. With increased traffic, there came increased accidents, and ships being destroyed or missing altogether. The area around the moon of Nessa was no different, with many ships disappearing in the region. However, what started as just a space or ghost story would soon become an important mystery, one that would again push humanity further and faster. This all came to a head in August of 2262. The North American Alliance Type 4 cargo vessel, the Goodman, was on a routine supply run to an orbital platform by Neptune. Three hours until its final destination, a piece of debris smashed into the starboard engine array and sent the ship wildly off course. The ship drifted for several hours before the crew managed to get her limping once more. What happened next would be investigated and examined by the best minds of humanity. The following is the last transmission of the Goodman, speaking with an operator at the nearest comm station. Beginning archive playback. Copy that. Adjusting course to 78. Y'all got it sorted out? I think so. Gave us a bit of a scare, but I think we're okay. How's it looking? We're back on track. You guys good? Back to send a tow. No, we got engines back up. And nav's online. Huh? What the hell is that? Hey, Pete, do you see... Signal lost. Investigations of her last known position found no wreckage, no survivors, nothing. The ship vanished without a trace near Neptune's moon of Nesso. The Goodman was not alone. Two more ships would disappear in the same area as the Goodman under similar circumstances. In both cases, more investigations were launched, but neither could find an answer. Out of frustration, the nations of the system declared the area a no-fly zone until they could figure out the disappearances, and the region began to be known as the Nesso Triangle. While many gave up trying to solve the mystery, one man would stick to it. He was an astrophysicist and a pilot named Nick Croshaw. He didn't know it, but he was about to make the biggest discovery since the quantum core engine almost 200 years before. Nick Croshaw started his investigation by looking for patterns between the various missing ships. After some time, he and his team discovered that each of these ships had something in common. They were old 
and lacked proper maintenance. As a result, their quantum core engines had similar variances in their operations, not quite correctly calibrated. He suspected that these mistuned engines were the key to the mystery, and soon realized that they were interacting with a previously undiscovered astral anomaly in the region. An anomaly he believed marked the beginning of a naturally formed traversable wormhole to another solar system, what he would dub a jump point. The key to accessing these jump points was in the faulty quantum drives. Working with RSI, he helped design not only a device to simulate the conditions to open the jump point, but a small ship that was maneuverable and tough to survive any conditions he would encounter. This ship would become known as the X-7, and by 2271, it was ready for its first jump. On April 10th, 2271, Croshaw and the X-7 set off towards the opening of the jump point in the Nesso Triangle. Activating his modified engine, he watched as the massive opening of the wormhole appeared before him. He then pushed his ship into the opening and disappeared. Riding the eddies of the jump point, he eventually exited the anomaly into the light of another star. After taking some scans of the new star system, he then turned the X-7 back around and returned to Seoul, emerging from the jump point, now being the first person ever to successfully navigate a jump point to and from another system. When he returned, he reportedly said, humanity has always been told to reach for the stars. Well, it looks like we may have finally caught one. The return of Croshaw from his first jump marked the beginning of a new age for humanity. Where before we were limited by our technology and distance, we could now reach distant stars in a matter of moments. And like Commander Dave Scott so eloquently said, there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. So explore, man would. Thank you for watching. I'd like to thank the Patreons on screen now for their continued support. If you want to join them for as little as $5, you can support future episodes of this series and get early access to videos from this series as well. I'd also like to thank the editor for this episode, Uri, who, without their help, this would not be possible. This is the most ambitious project I have ever attempted to make. I will be chronicling over 900 years of in-game history, much of it fragmented or incomplete, into a single long narrative line. Its purpose is to give a better context to the events and the universe of the game and more linear timeline format, which is easier to follow. Lastly, there's likely going to be some addendums, short changes added in this series as it goes, simply because retcons and additions to the lore are common for a game in development. Thanks again for watching. Remember to like the video to help spread the word, comment down below with questions or comments, and subscribe for future videos. Like I say every time, remember, Exhistoria ad astra.